Hey folks, it is May 20 Thursday, and this is once more the Daily Word. You know, many years ago, John Wimber spoke about our cultural obsession with wealth and our pursuit of prosperity. And I remember him confronting the sin in that obsession as he called for financial integrity in the churches and a spirit of generosity in people. He balanced his objection to prosperity being a focus of faith with this. He said, I've tried poverty and I don't like it. I know what he meant. He meant that Jesus does love to bless us. And because he loves to bless us, he tells us how to prosper in life. But we miss the mark when we allow that to become our focus at the expense of a cross-centered sacrificial lifestyle. Well, over the course of the last year and a half, the material security that we once knew has been threatened. It's been more than a recession. It's threatened our freedoms and our very way of life. For a lot of people, fear and isolation have brought on depression, even despair. But Jesus taught us a remedy for the depression that can take hold when times are uncertain and economics seem threatened. Matthew chapter 6, start at verse 19. Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Well, it seems that moths have broken in and stolen. Verse 20, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <clears throat> well, what is the real treasure, and what's the benefit to you? Well, Jesus was, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus was always about love, and by that he meant covenant. He meant deep, sacrificial, committed connections between people. He called it treasure in heaven, but as you read on, you find out that he wasn't just speaking about heaven. I mean, put it in its context. He was speaking about mental and emotional health through relationships here on earth. He connected treasure with relationships that are made deeper by the selfless sacrifices we make for one another as he sacrificed for us. So when we sacrifice for one another and for the kingdom of God and we share materially, we store up treasure in heaven for eternity, and then our heart, our love, follows after our investment. Love grows for one another in the present, and love grows with God for eternity. So Jesus went on to say this, verse 22, The eye of the lamp is the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. Verse 23, But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Well, this has nothing to do with metaphysics, as some people are tempted to think. Jesus used a figure of speech that every Jew in his day would have understood. It was said that a generous man had a good eye, while a stingy man had a bad eye. Generosity feeds the soul. Self-centeredness is a straight line to darkness and depression. Jesus was concerned for more than just happiness in heaven for eternity. He wanted to see us blessed now in this, li in this life. So he said that a generous person will be full of light inwardly. So there's joy and goodness in life for a person who lives to give. But there's only darkness and depression for the one who holds back out of concern for his or her own welfare. We've been living a season we've been living in a season of need and uncertainty and I've watched I've watched deep bonds of love growing between those who have shared with one another out of resources and time as needs arose the heart follows the gift in other words the best way to overcome depression and fear in a time of economic trouble or uncertainty is to give in the face of it the outcome is that you'll more deeply love those you give to and sacrifice for because your heart will be where your investment is gone. Give to and through your church, and it will feed the bonds of love there. It'll anchor your heart and spirit to heaven, and it'll anchor your heart to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. This is what makes life full and wonderful. Right now, the economy in the U.S. seems to be recovering as COVID restrictions are being lifted, but serious troubles on the horizon as inflation accelerates due to economy-killing decisions by our government, 
Jobs are already fleeing south of the border as companies relocate to avoid projected tax increases. We're going to have to be ready to share with one another in some very generous ways in the days to come. Isaiah 58 makes the same point. Very different words. The people in Isaiah's day thought they were being faithful to God. They fasted, they prayed, they worshipped, but they wondered why God didn't seem to answer. Why did their economy remain stagnant? And why did their faith seem to be dry and lifeless? They said, why have we fasted and you do not see? And God answered in Isaiah 58, begin at verse, begin at verse 7, Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring homeless poor into the house? This is the kind of fast that pleases God. When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Well, God's economy works on investment, but it's investment sacrificially in the lives of others and for the sake of the kingdom of God. Notice it's not give from your surplus. It's divide whatever you have. If I think there's only enough for me, then I need to invest by dividing the little I have with those who need. And God responds to that in verse 9. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. There's also a generosity of heart involved. He said, if you remove, this is just read on, if you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, generosity of heart. If you want restoration and healing and prosperity, stop the negativity about people. Verse 10. And if you give yourself to the hungry. Well, it looks like God is saying it's not enough just to hand out food at a food bank or give a $20 bill to a homeless person out the window of your car at a stop sign or to give to your church to keep its ministries going. God says give yourself. It's possible to give materially and yet stay distant without, without ever entering into a relationship in which you've risked yourself. God is a covenant God. This means relationship. So he continued, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Our world was full of troubled and hurting people long before the coronavirus struck. Broken homes, kids raising themselves. Parents who couldn't tear themselves away from the TV and their evening of smoking pot long enough to take their kids to a youth group that might save their lives for the next 70 years. Drug addictions, the list is long. Will we give ourselves to such as these to satisfy the emptiness in their lives and hearts as well as their material needs? If we'll do this, God says, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday Verse 11, and the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places. <clears throat> well, when the Great Recession hit in 2008, I had told the people of my church a year beforehand that it was coming and that those associated with us would be protected in the midst. You know what? Not a single job was lost. We not only didn't cut back, we expanded our ministries. We expanded our ministries. And it's been the same story in this current crisis. We kept giving, and God keeps returning blessing and multiplying the love we share. We minister to those who have it together as well as those who don't. We have people who own prosperous businesses, and, and we have those who live in poverty or on welfare, rich and poor, educated and uneducated. We've consistently invested in people, food bank, emergency assistance, effective biblical counseling and inner healing for the broken. We've invested over the years in a full-time youth pastor when we couldn't afford it to reach a lost generation. We've invested in a full-time missions pastor to reach out and give to Native American reservations that are like third world countries in the middle of the United States. We spent a lot of money and resources ministering overseas in Eastern Europe and Africa. We are not a large church. We're probably not even medium sized yet, but God has more than sustained us in all this. We're standing strong now because in the face of a crisis that caused many churches to close permanently, we've continued to give away what we have. And the more we give, the more God gives us to give. God continued in Isaiah 58. He said, And give strength to your bones, and you'll be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. 
I find it interesting that the human immune system stems from the white blood cells and antibodies generated in our bone marrow. God will give strength to your bones. It's a metaphor for health that just happens to reflect solid science. Our church never complied with the closure orders or group limitations after the second week of this coronavirus, and by his grace, not a single case of COVID has ever stemmed from our gatherings. Strength to our bones. Well, here's the point. Health, wealth, prosperity, love, preservation in a difficult time, restoration after disaster, it all flows from the economy of the kingdom of God. Sacrificial investment brings abundant blessing at every level of life. In the days to come, it will become increasingly important to listen to God, not the politicians, not the media, not your own fears. Believe God and act on it. Light will rise in the darkness. I know because I've lived it again and again. I know it to be true. Blessings to you all, and God bless.